Oh, okay, we are going. Hi, everybody. We're just giving uh, everybody an opportunity to log in on Zoom. So stay with us and we'll start shortly. Hi, everybody. Just hold tight. We're just letting everybody in enter from the waiting room from Zoom. So appreciate your patience. Okay, I think we'll make a start. It's a, it's 11 a.m. So good morning, um, everyone. My name is Sinead Leahy, and I'm the principal scientist of the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, which is based in the lovely Manawatu in Palmerston North, New Zealand. I'd like to welcome you to this State of the Science webinar series. We are delighted that you've been able to join us here today. Please note throughout the year, the NZAGRC have a number of exciting webinars planned. So please keep an eye on our socials for more information. Today's webinar is focused on our Future Farm Systems Research Program. And we're very, very lucky in that we, we're going to welcome Dr. Naomi Parker, who is the newly appointed Executive Director of the NZAGRC. When I say newly appointed, uh, Naomi has joined us uh, almost a year ago in October, 2023. Naomi has an extensive background in the sort of science policy interface working uh, with the New Zealand government for, for many years. But Naomi is also a very passionate ecologist at heart. So we're very lucky to have her here um, today. So I'll hand her over. She will be the chair for today. So welcome, Naomi, and over to you. And I hope everybody enjoys the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Kia ora tātou katoa, ko Naomi Parker tōku ingoa. Um, as Sinead said, I'm the Executive Director of the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre um, and really delighted to be chairing the webinar today. Um, we're going to hear from Erica on the work that's been done to date on the new NZAGRC funded Future Farm Systems Behind the Gate programme. So it's uh, my job to provide a little bit of an introduction to Erica, who I have known for quite a long time. Um, so Erica is Managing Director of Ag First Manawatu, Manawatu Whanganui and Chairperson of Ag First New Zealand. She's an agribusiness consultant with strong experience working at the interface of environmental management and farm systems with farmers, industry organisations and government. She has also had significant involvement with agricultural environmental policy development and holds governance and advisory roles in several agribusinesses. And on top of that is a partner of Morrison Farming, a 1,250 hectare sheep and beef breeding and finishing enterprise in the Rangatiki. So um, yeah, a bit of an overachiever really. Um, so uh, I will hand over to Erica now, but please make sure as we go through that you pop your questions using the Q&A function um, and we will come back to those after we've heard you speak to us, Erica. So over to you. Thank you, uh, Naomi, and kia ora koutou, everyone. Really great to be here um, today and to share with you a little bit about the uh, Future Farm Systems, Systems Programme um, part one, so you heard from Lee Matheson a couple of weeks ago um, on part two, and if you missed that, I um, encourage you to, to jump on and have a look at that um, to get a full picture of where the program's at. So just for those that haven't heard about the Future Farm Systems Programme, um, it was started because there's been an apparent gap in the body of research associated with lowering farm emissions where uh, the focus was very much around, uh, or has been around, um, getting changes to BAU, so allowing business as usual um, with, with tweaks to the system and not so much around the disruptive impacts or transformational solutions that might be needed to achieve some of the um, uh, emission reductions um, that are required. So. This program was set up to explore uh, some of those more disruptive impacts and 
the way I like to think about it is what would agriculture in New Zealand look like in 20 to 30 years time in a low emissions economy? So there, there was two key um, areas of focus established. Um, the first being the farm level transition and looking at that from both an individual farm scale as well as a collective scale. And I'll get into talking about that a bit more Shortly, that's the, um, the part of the program that I co-lead. Um, and the other part is the, looking at the longer term impact on the wider primary sector, as well as rural communities from lowering emissions. Um, and as I said, I um, am really privileged to work with Lee Matheson from Karen Ag, who leads that part of the project. Um, and um, we will at some point bring the, these two parts together. So, uh, so keep an eye out for that. We're about two years into the program um, with, with various uh, challenges that we've, we've had along the way, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Um, so that just gives you a sense of the program overall. So coming to behind the farm gate or that farm level transition and in individual and collective scale, um, we, we set that up in two parts. So the first part was looking at five case studies of farmers who had reduced their emissions. Now we weren't looking for farmers who had reduced their emissions because they wanted to reduce emissions, so the motivation was irrelevant, but we wanted to find a good cross-section of farmers across the country who had made some changes in their farm um, that had reduced emissions. Um, these case studies are all published now on Ag Matters, so I encourage you to have a look at that, and I think the link will go up on the, um, in the chat if you haven't had a look at that website. It's a great resource um, to understand more about what farmers are, are doing. So, and as I said, these case studies are there. There's a bunch of other case studies on there, as well as some really great content um, to support all those working in emission reduction um, across primary sector in New Zealand. Um, the changes that we were looking at uh, were reasonably broad. So. Um, there was management and farm system changes, as well as a bit of um, complementary land use change. So we weren't looking at farms that had done wholesale land use change, for example, a sheep and beef farm going into um, forestry, obviously would reduce emissions. We were more interested in where there was an integration of um, alternative land uses as part of the practice change, um, while still maintaining ruminants in the system. Um, and I've got the five case studies that we looked at up here. Uh, for those of you that attended our webinar um, at the early stages of, of this program, I think we did one in 2022, um, I went into a bit of detail about Kitty Kitty, um, the irrigated Canterbury dairy farm. Um, today I'm going to just present a little bit on a couple of others, and then if you want the rest, you have to jump on Ag Matters to have a look. Um, so we did Pokatoy, uh, so I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, Niwa, um, a hill country property, sheep and beef property in uh, Wairoa um, that has faced significant impact from, um, from recent weather events. Um, Poaroa, I'm also going to talk a little bit more detail about that. Um, and then Kinross, a deer, primarily deer farm in Manawatu uh, with also sheep and cattle. As I said, I think um, hopefully you've got the message that Ag Matters is a great place to go. So jumping into a couple of these case studies, and this is just to give you a flavour, um, you can grab a whole lot more detail um, by, by jumping on the website and having a look. Um, there's also video forms, so we've made it really easy for you to, um, to learn about these great farmers. So Pokatoi is a sheep and beef farm in the Mani Um, It's nearly 2,900 hectares, roughly 2,700 effective, and it's run by the Crutchley and Hagen families. Roughly half of the property is in hill and high country, and you can see the, um, the nature of that in the image here. Um, and the rest is flat land with about 500 hectares irrigated. Um, it's around 15,000 stock units, so six to 7,000 and six to 7,000 ewes um, amongst that. Um, as you, for, for those of you that know the Mania Toto, very challenging climate, um, pretty much no grass growth for at least three months of the year, um, and very hot dry summers as well, uh, low rainfall. So 
uh, reasonably limited options in generally in this area, um, a relatively extensive environment. Um, the, it put the toy they achieved a 5.3% reduction in biological emissions, so methane nitrous oxide from 2019 to 2023. Uh, this was an interesting one in that a, a core driver was actually to, to look at reducing emissions after Emma um, attended the Nessie um, Greenhouse Gas course and uh, looked at what their emissions were doing and thought that they needed to come down and there was potentially market um, opportunities from doing that. Um, but the changes that they made also align with the broader family goals. And I think that's a really important thing to highlight that any farm system changes that farmers are making need to be long term and align with broader goals of all those involved with the business. So what did they do to achieve the reduction? Uh, so winter crop went down significantly. Uh, and that also meant less nitrogen fertilizer going on, so less nitrous oxide. Um, stocking rate was overall was reduced by about 1.5%, um, but total uh, kilograms of carcass sold, uh, carcass or live weight sold off the property increased um, quite significantly, which meant they were able to increase profitability, um, and cattle numbers were reduced as well. Uh, obviously, uh, at the moment, that's a um, challenging position that many farms are facing where uh, the return in beef is more than with lamb, and so we might see a bit of a shift back to more cattle um, across the industry as, as farmers negotiate um, those that commodity cycle. Um, Co-benefits that Pukatoi found were uh, reduced nut nutrient loss there in Otago, so there is uh, nutrient limits in place here, so as well as reducing emissions, also reduced nutrient loss, which is quite logical. Um, Ewe condition has been easier to maintain um, with just slightly less pressure from reduced stocking rate and that's meant that the individual animal performance has increased. It's given greater flexibility in the business. They've retired a number of areas of land that weren't um, so suitable for pastoral farming and then they've looked at other uses for that primarily in this instance vegetation. Um, so looking at both timber and uh, carbon out of those areas. Um, and they've been more resilient to climatic stresses. So that just gives you a flavour of, um, of a case study from, from one end of the country. And if we head north um, to Poirua, a dairy horticulture and dairy beef um, range of properties on the Hauraki Plains. So Poirua is jointly owned by Ngāti Māru, Ngāti Paua, Ngāti Tamatera, Ngāti Tara, Tokunui and Te pa Patu Kirikiri. Um, they have eight dairy blocks, a dairy beef block in our horticultural unit, and the whole lot is on um, flat drained peatland um, with a significant area that's actually uh, retired from grazing as well. Uh, across all of those blocks, they run about 4,300 cows and are doing around 334 milk solids per cow. They've seen a significant drop in emissions from changes they've made. So 14% reduction in biological emissions over that 2018 to 2023 period. Um, the reason we've got different baseline years is we were looking at when changes were made. So it wasn't about comparing um, everyone with the same baseline, but saying when did you start making some system changes and we were comparing relative to that point. Um, it, over that same period, profit increased by 60 to 100%. There's a range there because it was it varied across those different blocks. Um, the drivers of those changes were that they were trying to be proactive. Um, they are in the Waikato, so significant uh, implications with freshwater management for, for them, um, particularly in their sensitive landscape around the um, the peaked wetlands. Um, they also wanted to improve profitability and labour efficiency um, and importantly match uh, land use um, to the land type. Um, and we saw that consistently came through all of the case studies that farmers were really assessing each bit of land quite hard um, to ensure that they were um, doing the best by the land but also for their business.
So how did they achieve those changes? They reduced cow numbers and increased per cow production. And the case study goes into how what, what that change has been. Um, they increased the homegrown maize area um, and, and rather than buying it all in, um, obviously you're buying in more um, nutrient, which can increase emissions there. One block was converted to dairy beef. Um, one very uh, unproductive block was, was um, put into blueberries, so about 10 hectares there and future plans to double that area. Um, and moved one herd to once a day. And I will just point out that um, once a day is a great way to, to reduce emissions um, as long as total feed eaten um, does actually reduce. Um, we see a lot of amazing once a day farmers who are actually um, have their emissions went down initially and they've gone up um, subsequently because they're doing a really good job of it, um, but they're, they're eating more um, now. So great, highly productive cows, but actually haven't reduced emissions. So just a cautionary tale on that one, um, but for them that did make a difference. And the co-benefits that they saw were increased profitability, um, improved cow conditions. So again, that came through consistently that as these um, farm system tweaks were made across all our case studies, the condition of, um, of cows or ewes were, was improved quite significantly. That led to improved reproductive performance, staff under less pressure, uh, which is always a good thing, and, um, and obviously a significant improvement in biodiversity in those areas that they were able to retire um, out of the system. So that just gives you a, a bit of a sense of a, of a couple of the case studies. If we look across the board at the case studies, um, we saw a range of reductions from 2.2% to 16% over the three, three to five years. So as I said, different baselines for different farmers because we weren't worried about a specific policy baseline. We were looking at what's the impact of change. Um, as, as I've pointed out, the combination of reducing stocking rate and then improving per animal performance to achieve uh, no, no loss in profit other than that um, imposed on by commodity cycles. Um, management changes, so um, that obviously required change where there was reduced stocking rate and then some land use change as well, but um, carefully integrated into existing system. Um, really wide range of motivations, and as I've said, uh, improving the way land's managed and that relationship between land, water, people and business was really critical. Um, driving performance and profit, a core driver, understandably, these are um, commercial farms um, and improved resilience um, as well. They, all of these farms they have, were facing, had faced in the past some significant uh, climatic events. Uh, one of the interesting things, and it won't be surprising, but um, emissions fluctuate. So if you read through the case studies, you'll see that um, over, over that period of three to five years, um, so in some years emissions went up and some they went down. So, um, so that's an interesting thing to think about from a policy perspective that we are running a biological, um, a biological system and, and emissions will fluctuate depending on the seasons, as well as just um, embedding change and getting some of those management changes right uh, doesn't always work first time every time, same in any, any aspect of life. Um, we didn't get uh, directly any financials from any of our case studies and it wasn't due to them being poor performers, it was just due to um, pr privacy concerns about sharing that, that information. So I've, I've presented what, um, what they told us but um, it, it is difficult to access that information and attribute it to a person as well. Um, we, we asked them as we went through the case studies what barriers to further changes they, um, they saw and also what barriers they thought other farmers would face and the lack of policy clarity came through really strongly and bearing in mind this was uh, nearly two years ago that we finished these case studies so um, so we're in the peak of policy uncertainty at that point in terms of uh, emissions pricing. Um, I don't, we haven't had any further certainty since then. Um, and it does uh, really create uncertainty for farmers who are, 
have this tension of what's going to happen with policy versus what's my market asking for. Um, so interesting to see how that plays out and we're seeing that come through our collectives as well. So that's a bit of a whirlwind tour of our case studies. Um, as I said, I encourage you to have a good look at those on Ag Matters and feel free to, um, to fire any questions my way. And I'd just like to acknowledge Bill Juno, who um, I, I was lucky enough to work with on the case studies, who did all the number crunching. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're more than happy to talk to people about those. So I'll jump into collectives now. And this one is a wee bit tricky. Um, because we're still um, we're still in the in the midst of this part of the research, um, and you'll understand shortly why. But I can't talk too much about them because we're still um, forming some collectives. And if I tell you too much, uh, we won't have the greenfields approach. Um, potentially, we're going to influence some some of the thinking that new collectives might have. So I'll talk a bit about that um, in a minute. So at the moment, we've got three collectives operating and two more uh, in formation. So um, we have the Mid Tyree GHG Catchment Collective. Um, they've been operating for two years. So I'll give you a little bit more insight into um, where they're at. Um, and then we've established two more, and as I said, um, another two uh, in this calendar year. So we have the Upper Moa Whongo, Upper Rangitike Catchment Collective, and the Ruatuki Greenhouse Gas Collective. Uh, which is all whenua Māori. Um, these collectives are groups of farmers who, uh, or landowners who, are, who have all been working together in some way, shape or form uh, already. And what we are trying to test is if we uh, create a genuine farmer-led process, so it's completely up to them, we present this opportunity statement to them that I'll talk through in a minute. What do they, how do they respond to that? And we've got a social researcher, Tony White, um, who is supporting our work with this. We provide a facilitator and we provide resource for that collective to address the opportunity statement. And beyond that, it's relatively unconstrained in terms of how they might explore that. Obviously, with public money, they can't just go spending the money on whatever they like. Um, but we we present them with the opportunity statement. So that is to identify how the collective can give meaningful effect to the aspirations of the Zero Carbon Act while retaining their financial viability and directly contributing to the reduction of gross methane emissions from the primary sector. So it is a focus on gross methane reductions, um, but we we are not constraining them in any other way. So um, so they can explore that as they need to as a collective to be able to to grapple with that. Um, so they they decide how often they meet. They decide um, who or what they need in terms of people supporting that. Um, and we provide a facilitator and support. And then Tony is researching and observing and understanding how they go about making those decisions as a collective. Uh, for that, she's doing uh, interviews as the collective is, um, is formed, um, and then progress interviews down the track. So, um, so as I said, I'd love to be able to um, present you with a whole lot of um, amazing insights that we have so far, but if I did that, then the new collectives would have access to that and it potentially influences how they might go about tackling the same challenge. So um, at some point we'll be able to pull them all together and hopefully share um, what they've all been doing and I'll be able to share it with you as well. Um, but that's where we're at at this point in time. Um, so just to give you a flavour of that, because it is a bit of a mythical kind of thing, um, we, so uh, there is a, a, a sort of been a different approach for the Whenua Māori Collective compared to the subcatchment groups. The subcatchment groups have been building an understanding of where they're at as individuals. Um, so they're looking at their own emissions profiles, what their own system opportunities might be and the influences of future climate. Um, and then once they've 
done that and got a good base level understanding, they've then shifted to looking at what some of the options might be. So uh, grappling with if we have to reduce stock numbers and we lose revenue there, what might we be able to replace that revenue with? Uh, so are there other land uses that we might be able to do? Are there other ways we could collectively utilise land? Um, what's the role in, of technology in improving profitability of the system? Um, so those kinds of things that they're starting to explore or have explored in a bit more detail, such as down in Pyre. Uh Both of the um, those catchment groups have looked at uh, the opportunity with sheep genetics. Um, and have also been exploring other um, aspects in terms of, of retiring some land and potentially putting it into vegetation. It's so similar kind of approaches to what we saw in the case studies. Um, they are getting experts in to talk to them, and that, that's quite broad in terms of the experts that they're um, hearing from. The groups are quite committed. They're meeting a bit more frequently than we initially anticipated, um, and they are very strongly committed, although I will say that uh, in year two, the commitment has dropped off a bit and the um, I think the change of government has reduced a little bit of the, um, the pressure to act really quickly. So especially with other pressures coming into the um, primary sector at the moment. As I said, I'll jump into a little bit more on the Mid-Tyre group because they are a, um, a full year ahead of, of the other so, um, and, and of course, the new ones that we haven't quite got off the ground yet. So um, the mid Tyree group, after just over a year of working together, um, pitched um, a proposal to the NZAGRC for another year of funding um, to develop a business case. And what so what they're working on now is, um, is being a bit more focused with that. Um, Getting, actually getting into a bit more detail around what opportunities they each have as individuals within current systems, uh, looking a bit more around mitigation technology, acknowledging that that's still a wee way off, particularly in that environment. So they're, they're not far away from uh, from Pukatoi, um, and Emma's actually a member of this collective as well. Um, as I said, they're looking at uh, the role of technology and how that might replace some lost income or, um, or also support if they're looking at market claims, um, how they might be able to use technology to share that with um, potential purchases of their products. Uh, they're looking at alternative land use opportunities, although interestingly in that catchment, historically there has been a lot of things growing there, um, which a number of which haven't worked. Uh, so we have um, these great insights from historic um, practices and while that's not necessarily not going to work now um, it is um, it is really useful to understand what maybe didn't work in the past and whether uh, those conditions have changed now um, to look at that and there's obviously a whole lot more resources available for farmers um, around what alternative land uses there might be um, our land and water did a lot of work down there for example on that and uh, not just looking at primary production either, um, but also adjacent uses such as agritourism. Obviously, we've got the, um, the rail trail there, uh, although not super profitable as an entity at this stage. Um, also looking at formalising the collective and considering how they might support a brand um, and demonstrate what they're doing. Uh, I'd love to claim that the project has led to a 4% redu reduction in their total emissions uh, in the past two years, which they have achieved, um, but I don't think it's uh, it's the pro project alone. Uh, I think it's probably more market conditions that have driven that, um, as most of that has come from a reduced uh, supplementary feed and a few less inputs which of courses, because all of those have been quite um, high pressure for the sheep and back. So that's where they're at. Um, if we look at collectives more broadly, um, we were, um, I, I don't know about surprise, but it was quite stark how well um, the likes of farm advisory, uh, like myself, uh, industry government have created farmer-led or so-called farmer-led initiatives 
where there's facilitators or experts or industry people that come in um, and set some uh, some boundaries and then we call it farmer led but it's very much around achieving those uh, outcomes within the boundaries and it's quite um, farmers have become quite reliant on that model and so when we went in and said it's up to you and it's my been the line that I have rattled off about a thousand times through this project so far uh, when they say Erica can we do this and I put it back on them and say it's up to you uh, it takes some time to get your head around that and to um, to not a to not have that that uh, someone else answering the question for you um, knowing that, that the support is there and we've always said you don't need to know who or what you need to analyze but uh, if you ask the questions we can provide the, the people with the um, potential solutions uh, but just to be putting the um, the farmer back in the lead um, and so it did did take has taken a bit of time um, for the farmers to get to get around that uh, ex except for our little tricky group they have um, they got that before we I think before we even started. So that hasn't, doesn't seem to have uh, come through yet, but we're very early days with that one. So uh, so some interesting insights there uh, and maybe some um, hard, hard truths for us um, in the industry around when we're being genuine about farmer lead or when, when it's farmers um, providing input to our uh, pre-existing determined outcomes or objectives that we're trying to achieve. And there's obviously a role for both, uh, and we'll explore that in a bit more detail uh, through this project with five collectives that gives us that opportunity. Um, our Tyree group have set their own target of a gross reduction from a 2022 baseline of 10% by 2026 and 25% by 2030. Super aspirational and far more aspirational than the Zero Carbon Act targets. And in a very difficult environment with very few levers to pull, so that um, that I thought was really um, quite inspirational that they uh, they set that for themselves. I'm not sure that they'll achieve they've achieved four percent now, so ten percent might be a bit tricky. But um, but you know that shooting for the stars and landing on the moon um, type approach. Uh, our other groups haven't quite got to the stage of setting a, a target per se. Um, so I'll keep you informed on that one. Um, the, but what we are also noticing is that um, through that, while that tension of being in charge, farmers, farmer led, um, can, can exist for a few months just to get going. Once it's there, um, it, it is, that where they'll, where they'll go with it is um, probably far more significant than probably we, we would expect um, based on what we're hearing across the industry. Um, the other interesting thing for those catchment groups is that because it's a relatively new new topic, um, so we've been working together on water um, primarily, uh, they're having to sort of rebuild group trust. So it's something we, we try to to work with existing groups to get, because um, we thought we, we wouldn't have to worry about that forming norming stage of groups, um, but we're, we're kind of still having to work through that. Um, and so that's that's been quite interesting. Um, as I said, the meeting frequency has been far greater than anticipated, but dropped off a, a bit more in, in the second year um, for Tari. We'll see what happens with other groups. Um, again, similar to our case studies, the what's been happening with policy has had a significant impact on the level of motivation of, a, of individuals within the group and the group as a whole, as well as what they will focus on at any given time. Um, and so that's been uh, been an interesting process to, to kind of navigate. Um, it took us two years to find a rohi level rupu. Um, and our um, approach, our Western approach to doing that was inadequate. So we had, we had to modify our approach uh, several times. We had 
several um, nearly nearly there and then um, fell through for various different reasons. Um, hopefully not us, but um, but we we did persist, and and the centre gave us the um the time and um space to get that right. And now um we we've got the uh, Otoki and hopefully another one tied up at uh, about to start. So um, it, it's fairly, it's a fairly obvious statement, uh, but uh, but an important one nonetheless. And as I said, the um, the Ruatuki Collective have taken a, a completely different approach um, to what our other two collectives had from from at the start point at the same point. Um, and part of that, I think, is the ownership structure. So. Uh, we're working across management and governance, um, and so it's important to have the right people in the right conversations at the right time, and for them to lead that, not us. Um, but also, I think Tikanga is coming through um, incredibly powerfully there, uh, and so really, um, really interested to see how that progresses. So what's next? Um, so as I said, we've got two more collectives just in the, in the early stages of formation, one in North Canterbury and, um, and hopefully one in Tairapati. Um, we will work with, the, continue working with all of the collectives um, and progressing how they want to tackle their opportunity statement. Um, as these newer collectives uh, progress through that, they, they have the opportunity to move into that phase two business case, which hopefully we might get a couple of them into that in, that, in a few months' time. Um, and then Lee and I will be um, producing a white paper um, at some point, once we've got the collectives far enough down the track, uh, to pull a whole program of, of work um, together. We also have quite a long list of um, of additional things we want to explore, including bringing uh, the the behind the farm gate work together with some of the insights Lee's been having around alternative land uses and also community response. So uh, watch this space, and I'm more than happy to take questions now. Naomi. Thanks, Erica. Um, that was a really fantastic presentation. Really great to hear the progress um, and your insights to date. Um, in the Q&A, we've got one question, um, which I think was off the back of some of the case studies, um, which is, was disease control and management used as a way um, to decrease stocking rate? Uh, no, um, I think um, I'm not quite, Quite sure what that question's getting at, other uh, other than um, if I understand it right, um, what well, you might need to help me out here, Naomi or Kat, if you could give yeah, us. Yeah, Kat, can you expand on the talk? <laughs> give us a bit more um, insight. Sorry. That's <laughs> all right. While we're waiting for that, um, a couple. I guess a question from me. In both the um, case studies and in the collectives, you talked about policy uncertainty as being um, a real a real uh, impact on motivation. So, what what particular aspects of that uncertainty um, were coming through as a as an issue? Um, I think that the key one is emissions pricing, and um, um, not surprisingly, um, and we. We started with Matari um, in the midst of the Hewaka Ipinaya process. So, um, so there was, uh, I would say that probably helped drive um, commitment to the collective is this is coming at us. Uh, now we have to, you know, we're, we're going to have to respond. At least we can do it collectively with our mates sort of um, attitude, I guess. Uh, and th But then... With that also came um, all of the um, uncertainty ar that around that. So, so lots of changes. Um, they were only being presented with what was coming through media and then industry presentations. 
um, myths and disinformation obviously circling around communities and on, on social media. Um, so so and the, and then that all died off and we had change of government and the walker um the, the walker is sunk and uh and now um there's there's nothing there other than you know by by 2030 at the latest we'll have something um but that that's still a wee way off so um but markets are now starting to pick up and so in terms of their drivers and so there's this uh, sort of tension of do I don't I act if I act now will I be penalized for that you know will the will the guy over the fence that hasn't done anything be better off for not doing anything because they might have more opportunity when pricing comes in because they you know all these changes that that four percent or that sixteen percent or even that two percent that I've already done how will that be recognized um or there's also we're seeing particularly um, with lots of ongoing changes to the ETS. Uh, do I put land? Do I take some of my not very productive land out now, or do I wait a bit longer until the ETS is settled? Um, so that it's it's a bit of a maelstrom of um, of potentially market regulations. Uh, emissions pricing threats that continues to sit on the, the shoulder of farmers um, and the, also the uncertainty around ETS. And then all of that wrapped up around community uh, and, and some of the impacts there. Um, and then, you know, we've seen in some parts the um, significant impact of the likes of Cyclone Gabrielle and Cyclone, Cyclone Hail. So suddenly that's created a big um uh, policy uncertainty at a local level of how do we, you know, manage retreat and all these other things are kind of coming into play. Do we a forest back with the same thing? What's happening with our land? What's happening with community? So all of that, I think mm -hmm. that's a very long answer. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. I think that um, that deeper insight into what you're you're hearing um, from farmers is really helpful. Um, and we've got some more questions coming through. Can you just um, stop sharing, Erica, so people can see you? Oh, sorry, yes. As well. I had a mental note to do that, but mental notes are what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's one from Susie that says, um, have you noticed there seems to be a myriad of catchment groups emerging with different focuses? Um, farmers might be confused about what to focus on, GHGs, fresh water, pest management, other purposes, um, or what group to be involved in, and you talked a little bit about um, a bit about some of that complexity as well. Um, are you getting a sense that that's affecting um, farmers wanting to participate in one or more groups? Is it you know which way do I go? Or yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question, Susie. I know it's probably the pointed one too. Um, <laughs> the um, I I think um, so so I think where catchment groups exist and are working really well, they're a super powerful tool. Um, but we uh, do run the risk at the moment of putting all our eggs in one basket and saying catchment groups are the solution to everything. It seems like an easy way for uh, central local government to channel a bunch of things and get a bunch of things done. And therefore, and, you know, collective farmers all together, happy working together in community and, and they'll tick the box and away we go. Um, but that's, you know, on the ground, there's a there's a lot of parts of New Zealand where catchment groups don't really work. Um, the community cohesion might happen across multiple catchments, um, even across regional boundaries. Um, you've And you've got a whole lot of other factors coming into play. And so I think, uh, and, and as you point out, farmers um, wanting to participate in one or more groups um, means we are really testing the boundaries of commitment here in terms of this is really important, but so is this and so is this other thing. And so um, so whose is most important today? And, you know, emissions pricing is a long way off. Therefore, we go back to fresh water being the most important thing of the day. And so, sorry, Erica, but I'm not. I just can't do it today. I'll talk to me in five years' time. And so, but that's not just environment. That's production. That's um, you know, 
getting getting along and supporting school community events. There are so so many pressures on everyone's time to be part of part of a group, and we don't. I don't think we work hard enough to think about what some of the consequences of group dynamics and what you might be expecting from those groups without um, to get the outcomes that we're looking for. So I think we do run the risk of oversimplifying and, and charging down catchment groups as a solution to all our problems. Um, those of it who have been around long enough will know catchment boards, uh, you know, that was the catchment groups of old and they were really effective uh, at the time and then they they kind of ran their course. And I think um, I think we need to be, be wary of, um, of a one-size-fits-all approach and, and being conscious that not everything is going to be solved by collectives or community and the community of interest could be actually quite um, a wide range of farmers from across the country working together. They don't have to be geologically constrained by a, a water system. So. Thanks, Erica. And there's a bit of a, a follow on, I think, to what you've been saying um, from Aslan, which talks about, um, do you get a sense of how many collectives are focusing on GHGs <laughs> um, across the country? Um, as, is, uh, they've written, um, most I assume, focus on water or biodiversity. Yeah, um, a, a great question, Aslan. I, I, from what I've picked up, and it's just, it's, you know, there's, I have no evidence to pick this up, but um, other than doing, being around, um, there's two or three kind of where it's on the radar, but it's certainly not, um, not a focus at all. And, um, probably why we are still working on getting uh, a couple of these off the ground um that the appetite is is there but it's not quite there yet if that makes sense yeah um this one's on a, a slightly different tack do you want to expand more on the market drivers such as scope three um yeah, and this is this was a, a bit of um, something I was thinking about too. Is how do we think about those market drivers in in the context of um, what you're doing with the collectives and the customers? Yeah, um, and another um, interesting question. And as I said, the I think at the moment there's too much um, tension and uncertainty around um, market drivers and policy um, uncertainty that uh, is meaning farmers are reluctant to act. Um, again, you know, you've got a market driver right now, um, particularly in the dairy industry, it's it's uh, it's not coming through quite so strongly in the meat industry yet, um, although it's getting, getting there. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, you know, you, you've got market drivers and possibly a government hoping that the market will sort it out. Um, that that's a, a certainly sense I get, uh, and you know if there's no market failure, then there's no need to for regulation. But uh, if you think about um, the likes of the dairy industry um, and and some of those targets that they've set, um, it's quite a lot to put on uh, an individual company, even though they're large, um, to achieve that across a really broad range of farmers. So. Um, in our groups, um, we've got we've got a mixture um, of land users. Uh, you've got a mixture in terms of opportunity that, and relationships that they have with processes around what they might be able to achieve. Ultimately, with all of these, it comes down to is there a financial benefit for me of of acting at this stage? So, it's either a carrot or a stick. And the market's going to need to do it with carrot, uh, and the government is probably going to do it with a stick. And so everyone loves the idea of the market doing it, but the market is not actually necessarily putting out um, putting out more money at this stage to do it. I know there's some uh, some projects um, between Fonterra and Nestle uh, looking at this. Um, but also, some uh, I've, I've done a number of sustainability link loans and sustainable finance work, and um, and trying to communicate the biological system and the fact that actually we might go up this year, or that 
we can have an emissions intensity target as well as a gross target, um, but one or other is going to be completely driven by um, old Huey up there with sunshine or no sunshine and rain and no rain um, at, at the wrong time, no doubt. Um, those, yeah, I, I think um, it's a it's a tension filled space and I think really difficult for processes. Um, uh, it's dangerous to say this on a public webinar, but I think if we had um, some degree of face uh, regulation, and I'm not um, advocating for a significant price in place, but that would help provide uh, confidence to the market that we at least have a minimum standard, um, and then uh, processes could, um, could look at differential pricing or rewarding uh, those farmers going above and beyond where they might be able to um, achieve that from the market as well and that might be a, a way of navigating this a bit of share the love or the hate is if you want to think about it that way great um so cat's come back with um a bit more of a uh, bit more detail around the question so um disease control and management on farm would result in uh, healthier animals that are more efficient and productive Therefore, a farmer could have the same or increased productivity from fewer animals if the diseases are controlled. So was, was that a fact? Okay, great. Thanks, Kat. Appreciate the clarification. Um, the, so and uh, I think in all of the case studies and in a number of the other case studies on Ag Matters uh, and in also a bunch of the work that um, Phil Janot and I have done modelling farms, uh, Takahuri Whenua project as well, uh, which was um, first few years was funded by the centre. Also, um, the the reduction in stocking numbers and then improving uh, per animal performance um, in many cases will result in less emissions, less nutrient loss, and increased profitability. However, to achieve that you need to change management. And not all farmers have the capacity, capability or ability to change their management. And there could be a whole lot of reasons for that. It might be access to labour, it might be ageing farmers that don't have the physical capability anymore, uh, a whole raft of reasons. So it's not that they're bad farmers. Um, and so what we do is we put this, you know, here's the here's the modelling that I can happily do from the comfort of my office with my heat pump on and no planting trees to offset the emissions. And, <laughs> um, and then, then it's up to the farmer to do the hard work to actually change their management because we grow, we're pastoral systems, you have less stock, you, have, you need to do more work to manage the pasture so that you are still uh, able to get that improved performance per animal. Um, the disease side of it and, and health, as I, as I said, those farmers were reporting better, better condition in their stock, which um, I haven't looked at the impact on, say, animal health of that, um, but that's an area that, that could be of interest. I think the key here is that we need to find solutions that are both within existing farm systems, so tweaking existing farm systems, as well as potential transformational change that may be required over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and when, when we're looking at the farm system aspects, it needs to tick a whole lot of boxes. It needs to work for the people, it needs to work for the business, it needs to work for animals, and it needs to work for the environment, um, and ideally for the community at large as well. So, um, so that co-benefits thing is probably underrated and possibly requires a bunch more work. Um, given that GHG numbers are volatile over the seasons reported, do you think low commodity prices played a role in reducing GHG numbers? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not just. Uh, it's not so. Uh, commodity prices and high on farm inflation. So you take out uh, inputs and during high on farm inflation. So reduce fit, you might reduce supplement, you might change some of the cropping practices you're doing. Um, and so that taking those out of the system will obviously reduce GHGs as well. It will also impact the bottom line. So yeah. No silver bullet for your team, sorry. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> That's yeah. why we've all got a job. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, we've got another one here. Is overseer the tool to account for GHG emissions in all cases? No. <laughs> um, we, uh, Bill and I use overseer for most of the case studies. Uh, actually, we might have used Pharmax for some as well. Uh, one or the other, we have used overseer or Pharmax. Uh, we use overseer or Pharmax, A, because they're, um, they're we can we can do the analysis. We can use them. We're not we don't need to um to get someone else to do that analysis for us. Uh, the the um all of the documentation around how um those tools um work is publicly available. Um and obviously obviously is publicly funded partially. Uh, but the critical thing of why we use OCR and Pharmax is because they um they recognise system complexity um, and a bunch of the other tools just don't have the um, the level of detail that we need to recognize farm system changes um, such as oh, you, you can recognize reduced stocking rate but you might not pick up um, slight changes to timing of nutrient applications for example um, or, or how a crop is used in the system. So yeah, there is a bunch of tools out there. Um, those those are the two that I prefer. Also with Pharmax, obviously we can look at financials and feed as well. Uh, and given that we're looking at farm systems, it's pretty critical that we think about this from a systems perspective. Thanks, Erica. I think uh, from what I can see, our questions have dried up online. Um, I've got one more. Um, in terms of the, um, I, mean, I was really interested in your comments about um, actually enabling farmer-led uh, processes um, and the, the challenge of that for both farmers and those supporting farmers. Um, any other kind of key takeouts on that from you? You know, how do we, how do we really make that happen? Yeah, um, I think being... We're not sure that farmer lead is the right, so farmer lead's not always the right solution. I mean, there's there's times where you actually just need a decision made, and so, or you need an outcome, um, and it needs to happen quickly. And actually, farmers don't have time for walking around with, we're all going to talk about this and figure it out collectively. You just need, you know, a de democratic or autocracy autocracy maybe, <laughs> um, which, we, you know, we're pretty good at. Uh, I think, so it's actually about understanding where, where it might fit. And we, jury's still out, right? We're in, a, this is a research project. So mm -hmm. um, so our hypothesis is that a farmer-led approach is a good way of tackling a complex challenge like responding to greenhouse gas emission reductions in a biological system. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure yet if, it, if that's the answer. So far, I would say I'd be very supportive of it. But I also, it's it's resource hungry. Um, or, and hopefully we will look at the, um, so it, it would do a degree of cost benefit uh, on that because I would actually um, surmise based on the pace of, of understanding that we've seen, even though it feels slow in time and money hungry, uh, I think it's probably got farmers a lot further ahead than anything we've done since 2002 when the Climate Change Response Act was enacted. Um, so it might be short-term short pain for longer-term gain, and that's something to consider. Um, but I think the other thing is we probably need to be really, um, we, we need to put our egos aside, those of us that are working in this kind of world, and uh, and accept that we don't have all the answers and actually creating the space and environment for farmers to grapple with this stuff in an environment where it's not, uh, you know, challenge, absolutely challenge what you're hearing, but it's not a black and white battle of the this way or that way and we're storming out if it's not, you know, if it's not the right on message. It's a complex challenge and we need to get our head around it. So it's, I think we, it's a new skill that probably a bunch of the industry and rural professionals 
um, should should have, but probably don't, and might require a bit of training for. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. How do we how do we train um, train ourselves around that? But I think that's a really useful insight. Um, we do have one other quick question, which is how do farmers deal with different tools, e.g., Farmax and Overseer, producing different GHG values? Does this add to the complexity? Um, yeah, but it's actually pretty easy to answer, right? So, um, yeah, you know, I'm farming too, so I can give you four or five different numbers. I'll give you the lowest one, of course, if you're asking. Um, but the the response to farmers is right tool for the job, right? So, um, so we we've used Overseer with the two collectives because both of them were already using Overseer for water, so it made sense. Tyree then actually wanted to do some farm systems analysis, so we then went into Farmax as well. Yep, gave us a different number, but it was a different tool for the job, and it wasn't about the number. It was about the um, trajectory of or trajectory of change, um, and understanding what drove the number and the the level of analysis that we were doing on the numbers in terms of uh, metrics that they were wanting us to look at was phenomenal, right? And that was an example of where give them the space and they'll give us the the gold. Uh, really tested my team in terms of how do we pull that number out to give them, but they were really getting driving behind the numbers and what's driving it, not the number itself. So my advice to farmers is use the same tool and track over time using the same tool, but use the tool that works for you. Don't try and retrofit a number. Yeah. Sounds like very good advice. Um, so uh, I think we can wrap up now. So um, just to... Thank you, um, Erica, hugely for your time today. Um, some fantastic insights to date, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where this program goes, um, and in particular as um, the components get pulled together. Um, so I think the only thing that is left for me to do um, is to thank everyone for attending, to thank you for speaking to us um, the presentation has been recorded, so if you want to listen to it all again, you can. Um, the link will be provided on the NZAGRC website um, within the next week. Um, and uh, just a, a very virtual um, but strong round of applause uh, for you. Thank you, Erica. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Kia kite.